All right, so why don't we jump in and I'll, um, I have the honor of introducing this really superb panel that we have before us today. My name is Amy Kapczynski. I'm a professor of law at Yale Law School and I co-direct um, both the Law and Political Economy Project, which is based at Yale Law School, but national in scope, and also the Yale Health Justice Partnership. And this is a collaboration between those two organizations. And it's going to kick off uh, a year-long series of events on care and health justice. And just wanted to say a word about why we came to this as one of our sort of major focuses for this, for this year. Um, it's not obviously lost on anyone in the middle of a pandemic that's still ongoing that care is a deeply important component of all of our ability to live separately and together and and that our infrastructures for care are uh, incredibly weak and put incredible pressure on um, many of us at different phases in our lives but disproportionately particularly uh, women and black and brown immigrant communities in particular. And so um, part of our interest in, in sort of trying to, to focus on care and the political economy of care is in trying to actually integrate questions of race and racism and gender and how social reproduction uh, operates in the political economy, more centrally into our conversations about political economy. There's a way in which sometimes when we say we study and think about political economy, people think of hard hats and factories, and, um, uh, and in fact, reproduce some of the exclusions that have been built into both our legal architectures and the way our economy operates. And we wanted to, um, to focus on care it's also obviously incredibly timely, not only because of the pandemic, but also because of the incredible organizing work going on, some by people in this um, in this virtual room that are shifting how um, the, the sort of parameters of the possible. And so it's really an exciting time to be doing this work. And that work is very much explicitly being thought about in a kind of power building way, which we're going to hear about today. So with, with that, let me just uh, offer a very brief introduction and then get our panel started. So we are gonna first hear from Gabe Winant. He's an assistant professor of US history and um, the college at the University of Chicago. His first book, The Next Shift, The Fall of Manufacturing and the Rise of Healthcare in Rust Belt America investigates the rise of the service economy um, and with a particular interest in healthcare and the aftermath of manufacturing. And Gabe's also um, widely read um, and writes really interesting things from in all kinds of um, places like N plus one um, and other short form uh, essayistic work, um, some of which I'm sure you all know. Uh, ask him about the PMC, that's what I'll say about that. <laughs> uh, then um, we'll have Peggy Smith, um, who really has been a, a long time and very important voice in the academic and uh, policy worlds on these topics. She is the Charles F. Nagel Professor of Employment and Labor Law and Vice Dean for Academic Affairs at Wash U, uh, in the St. Louis School of Law in St. Louis. Um, and she's uh, really um, done important work on the regulation of care work inside and outside the home, including childcare, home care, and elder care. And then um, last, we'll have Hei Young Yoon, who's the Senior Director of Policy um, Senior Director of Policy at the National Domestic Workers Alliance, which is a key part um, of the power building coalitions that are having a real impact on these issues um, locally and nationally. Over the course of her career, Hey Young has worked on a variety of low wage and immigrant workers rights issues and currently serves in many other capacities as a member of the Biden-Harris administration COVID-19 equity task force. So we'll have about um, seven or eight minutes of remarks from each of our panelists and then discuss um, some of these issues um, as a panel and then welcome your Q&A at any point. Just put your questions into the Q&A box. You know the routine by now. So let me turn it over to Gabe to get us started. Okay, hey, well, thank you, Amy, for that uh, kind introduction. It's very exciting to be here with these panelists who I really admire. And I have to say, you know, I, I was in graduate school at Yale when LPE was first forming, and it's been a project I've looked at with excitement and admiration for years now. So it's, it's nice to be virtually um, back kind of home. Um, and thanks also to Corinne and Raul and Bree and everyone at LPE for all of your work in making the project go, including this event. Uh, so I'm going to talk 
uh, at a kind of pretty broad level of, of generality about social policy and the history of social policy in the 20th century and how that has set up a situation where care workers are simultaneously so essential and so disposable, which I think is the kind of core paradox of the past uh, that we've seen emerge in the past uh, year and a half. So clearly, although as I'll be arguing to you, it predates the pandemic. And uh, you know, when, in my experience, when you talk to, for example, a healthcare worker about the phrase essential worker, uh, they will kind of roll their eyes at you because of that paradox, because of the experience of being treated disposably. Um, but there is real truth in the concept of essential that I want to I want to try to argue has a historical basis. Um, so the framers of the U.S. welfare state, I think it, we can now recognize clearly in retrospect, um, as as the sociologist Melinda Cooper puts it, quote, wanted to transform the family into a public responsibility, indeed the prime welfare function of the state. End quote. When we look back at the landmark social policy transformations of the 1930s and 1940s in labor law, social insurance, housing and banking policy, veterans affairs, and much, much more, uh, we can see how working class people were herded into nuclear families, those not able or willing to form them due to non-compliant sexual practices, racial discrimination in labor and housing markets, or a host of other reasons, then paid the price in stigma, exclusion, and second class social citizenship. Uh, within this arrangement, women's work was discouraged by social policy and largely unsecured by social protection, such as union rights, uh, that's even women's work outside the home, and non-compliant families were slotted into a second tier of access to social benefits. So with this uh, arrangement, the heteropatriarchal nuclear family emerged as what I think we can see as the elementary social instrument of the welfare state, the institution that was meant to concentrate the various assets, uh, the various entitlements of social policy to concentrate them together and thereby function as a social shock absorber. And at the center of this system was the male breadwinner, ensconced in stable long-term employment with internal labor markets, union protection, and so on. Systems of care were woven around him and access to social citizenship, healthcare, retirement, and so on, flowed through him uh, to those attached in relationships of legal dependency, such as uh, parent-child relationships and marriage. And so the crisis of such employment, of industrial work, quickly threw into crisis a broader section of the population that was tied up with uh, the stably employed, largely industrial jobs, but did not occupy them directly. It became a much bigger problem than just unemployment. And I think we can also see in retrospect the way that there was a secular decline in industrial employment, which began really in the 50s and 60s, uh, not the Reagan years, which is when we tend to think of it, when Harrington wrote The Other America, for example, famously discovering poverty in America, or when Lyndon Johnson launched the war on poverty a couple years later, they thought they were engaging with a residual problem, the pockets of American poverty not yet wiped out by American prosperity. But it turned out to be just the opposite. The urban ghettos and Appalachian hollers at the center of that conversation in the 60s were the first places to experience the industrialization. Appalachia, for example, lost more than half its mining jobs between 1950 and 1960. So when Lyndon Johnson went to Eastern Kentucky to launch the poverty program, he thought he was traveling to the past, but in fact, he was traveling to the future. As displacement from industrial work then widened in a long secular process from 1960 to the end of the century, it triggered a crisis of care, since care had been organized through and around those jobs. Both the families that were linked to uh, those jobs and supplied labor for those jobs, or for those factories and mines, and that subsisted from the wages and benefits that flowed back from them. And also in the larger institutional systems of social reproduction anchored in the welfare systems, both public and private, built around those groups of workers as actuarial pools, as bodies of consumers, and so on. In healthcare, which is a subject of my own research, as Amy said, deindustrialization gradually produced a population that was older, poorer, and sicker. The ability of the family to function in its classic buffer role, as imagined by New Deal policymakers against economic distress, was gradually overwhelmed by this process. And I think it's helpful here if I become less abstract and actually start to describe a group of actual people to you. So imagine a steel worker hired at a mill in Pittsburgh. My book is about Pittsburgh. Uh, hired at a mill in Pittsburgh in 1950, around age 25. He's married. He has a few kids. 30 years later, at age 55, he retires. That's, you know, in the collective bargaining agreements and in industries like steel, you could commonly retire before 65. Um, so now it's 1980 and he won't be replaced since the industry has undergone quite a lot of contraction already. The workforce has shrunk by 50% since 1950. Uh, 
And this leaves not just a smaller, but an older workforce, since seniority means the rate of replacement of workers does not keep up with their aging. This is why by the 1980s, deindustrializing places were markedly older than the rest of the country. So his wife worked a few jobs in the 40s, maybe before they got married or shortly thereafter, uh, as a waitress or in a laundry. But once he started work at the mill, she became a housewife, though she'd maybe sometimes pick up a few shifts during a recession or a strike. Generally, though, she managed the giant task of raising a milltown family, in particular involving a tremendous amount of cooking and cleaning, given the industrial filth in the air and on all the surfaces, the multiple dinners every day because of the different shifts her husband cooked, her, excuse me, the different shifts her husband worked, uh, and the out of work, disabled, and retired family members and neighbors who need to be fed and looked after. By the time they got to the 1980s, though, her daughters and her daughters in law would take care of that as she moved into retirement with her husband while the sons and sons-in-law became the next generation of steel workers. Except, as I just said, that replacement didn't happen. They get to 1980, the sons and sons-in-law don't become the next generation of steel workers. They don't get jobs at a steel mill because those jobs aren't there anymore. Some of them moved away to Texas or to Georgia instead. Uh, and the daughters and daughters-in-law who might've once imagined lives like their housewife mothers now realize they're going to have to enter the labor market and stay in it. And that means the older generation can't count on them for meals and help with laundry and care when they get sick or disabled. And who's gonna watch the kids in this context? Some of, uh, for some of this, the existing public-private welfare state can help. The retiree parents from, you know, the steel worker and his wife have very good health insurance from the steel mill, thanks to the collective bargaining agreement that he's still covered by. So they can tr transfer the costs of caring for them from their daughter onto the insurance company in the hospital and the low wage workers at the hospital. So there's phenomenal increases in hospital utilization in the 70s and 80s in deindustrializing places as this former function of the family gets externalized onto the healthcare system and hospitals start functioning almost like nursing homes. They staff up very rapidly, absorbing women who are now looking to enter the labor market. So when that daughter goes looking for a job, this is likely where she's going to go, entering a sector of the labor market already cordoned off by gender and to some extent by race as a low wage and precarious sector. But of course, she has kids too. These are grandkids in this family and who's gonna watch them? So in the 80s and especially the 90s, childcare labor markets expand very rapidly, absorbing even more vulnerable workers at the bottom of the labor market, particularly women pushed off, uh, pushed off of social welfare and uh, income support by state level workfare programs in the 80s and then federal welfare reform in the 90s. Uh, moreover, even in the healthcare industry, when Congress tries to push down federal healthcare spending in the 80s and 90s, its strategy is to shift patients into outpatient settings that it can pay less for. That's long-term care and home health care. And so it drives workers by a very similar process out of hospitals and into home health care and nursing homes. So what I've just described to you very rapidly is a way that uh, the systems of care built up around the industrial economy by the post-war welfare state which were developed in order to de deploy the unprotected, undervalued, and even unwaged work of women, people of color, and immigrants to manage and to buffer economic insecurity, went into overdrive with deindustrialization and the rapid increase of economic inequality that it caused. It's not overstating to say that these systems of care held our society together through the economic trauma of massive job loss and rapidly rising inequality, but they did so by conscripting the labor of the people with the least labor market power and pulling them into the sectors of the labor market that were the least regulated and protected. And they still do that now. Uh, they, they, that is the kind of core way in which the care economy expanded in order to hold us together and to kind of continue to knit up the unraveling parts of our society while dumping the burden of it onto those who are least able to resist the exploitation that that produces. Okay, I'll stop there, thank you. Thanks, Gabe. Uh, Peggy, you can pick it up from there. Super, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I wanna start with a word of thanks to the organizers for inviting me to contribute to such an incredibly important and timely topic. Uh, I very much appreciate this particular conversation because it centers workers at the core of the discussion. And all too frequently conversations about care work and the value of care work tend to privilege the experiences and the needs of care recipients while largely uh, 
excluding the understanding of the actual workers as workers, as individuals whose work is vital, not only to the well being of other families, but also to the well being and economic security of their own families. You know, part of what the pandemic has done is it has boldly highlighted a central question that we have been struggling with for years, which is who's going to care for an increasingly elderly population. And, and here's what we know. We know that the pool of informal caregivers is dwindling, even as families understood as women remain the primary source of care for elderly individuals for some time now their availability has been decreasing because of the demands of paid work, as well as the demands obviously of childcare as well. And so if you think about how we have dealt with that, uh, that sort of gap as a society, it really does sort of tap into what Gabe just said, which is that for some time now, we have dealt with the problem in part by really intensifying efforts to try and offload the cost of all forms of intimate care, including home care of the elderly, onto the shoulders of low wage workers, uh, especially women of color, especially immigrants. And having a safety valve historically of low wage labor has allowed us as a society to postpone a real reckoning, if you will, of how one should equitably regulate and organize the provision of care. Of course, what we're now seeing, and we clearly saw it in the context of the pandemic and the ongoing uh, difficulties posed by the continuation of COVID is that the strategy of relying upon low wage workers to try and minimize the cost of care, that strategy has been fraying for years. And the one good thing I hope that we get out of the pandemic is it really captures the extent to which we can no longer have these separate conversations where we talk about the need for care workers vis-a-vis -vis the families without having a conversation at the same time about the needs of these workers as workers. The bigger conceptual problem that Gabe spoke to is that as a society, we have really failed. We failed to think about work in the home as a legitimate occupation. And that failure has profound implications for how we treat home-based care workers, like for example, home care workers who are caring for the elderly. There's this tendency to think of uh, any kind of work that is performed in the home that involves intimate sort of reproductive work as work that is really different in kind and value relative to other jobs. And you really see that, you saw that historically, uh, during the context of the New Deal, during the progressive era, when folks talked about workers as a group of employees who should be protected by legally mandated rules and regulations that govern the employment relationship, the group of workers who did domestic work in the home rarely came to mind, right? They didn't factor in the collective vision of this notion of your model employee as someone who every morning gets up from his or her home, walks out the door and crosses that ideological divide between family and market, right? We're talking about a group of workers who really, they labor in isolation, within the homes of private families. And this is obviously a space where regulators have traditionally hesitated to intervene. The, I'm sorry, the domestic workers of old are really 
today's home care workers and the failure to think of domestic work as real work continues to haunt home care workers today. And you can't really understand that failure without also thinking about the role that the law has played in the devaluation of all forms of end home care work. So historically, labor and employment laws simply excluded this group of workers from coverage. That was true with respect to the progressive era regulations. It was also true with respect to legislation enacted during the course of the New Deal. Now, a lot of those exclusions have gone by the wayside, but even as today coverage exists, many of those laws continue to provide home-based care workers with a significant reduction in coverage. So what I wanna do with the rest of my time, I just wanna speak briefly to the importance of organized labor and unionization in really trying to make a difference in terms of how we think about the work that these folks do and the extent to we have the extent to which we can now think about them and appreciate that what they do has real value, has substantive value, allows other families to go out and earn a living, but also puts bread on the tables of the home workers' families. So organized labor has been incredibly important over the last 20 some odd years. It has made impressive gains in various parts of the country. Uh, so for example, in states like Washington, New York, and California, those gains have really been quite critical in helping to create a relatively stable workforce infrastructure that advances the economic status of home care workers and at the same time allows us to serve the interests of a rapidly aging population. You know, some of those obvious gains include uh, increases in compensation, the provision of health insurance, life insurance. In some states, you even have the provision of retirement benefits. But having said that, you know, it's really useful to step back and think about the really what a remarkable feat has happened in terms of the success of the labor movement when it comes to end home care workers over the last 20 or some odd years. And it's quite a remarkable feat because when it came to the notions of organizing in particular, you know, the sort of traditional understanding of organizing that is represented in the National Labor Relations Act is a form of organizing called industrial unionism. And that model of organizing workers never applied to domestic workers. It never applied to the folks who are today's home care workers. It was a model of unionizing that was really developed with regard to manufacturing workers. And so what the labor movement has done is to really create a totally new approach that allows them to provide these workers with meaningful representation and to allow them to do it in such a way that a group of workers that most folks looked at and thought, these workers are really independent contractors. There's absolutely no way they're ever going to be unionized. Well, the labor movement actually did it. And they did it by this process, essentially passing laws that created employers of records. They required state entities to step up to the plate and serve as an employer of record such that the workers would have an entity with whom their representative could in fact organize 
and push for real change. Amy, how am I doing on time? You're about to tell me I don't have any more time. Is that no, right? No, no, I think maybe take another two minutes if you, if, or three minutes if you, if you can. Sure. Uh, I guess I want to end by saying this. The labor movement has been incredibly important uh, in pushing the ball forward when it comes to home care work. But we should not kid ourselves, which is to say, the labor movement, while important, is certainly no panacea. And we have seen that in big and small ways. Uh, I believe currently there are only nine states that have enacted laws that will allow publicly subsidized home care workers to be able to form a union such that they're going to have a representative go and negotiate with one of these public authorities. So that's nine states. Of course, what about the rest of the home care workers out there who unfortunately really live in states that are hostile to unions? And so one of the things that I think we need to talk about and hopefully we'll do so when we turn to the Q&A is how do we move forward, right? How do we recognize that even as unions have been very successful, their success has been limited. And it's also been limited because right now we are experiencing incredible conservative anti-union sentiment. Uh, we saw that, for example, in the 2014 case of Harris versus Quinn, where the Supreme Court held that uh, publicly subsidized home care workers, they weren't really state employees, they were less than state employees. And that kind of devaluation, I think in order to understand it, you have to put it in the context of what I've indicated earlier. It has a certain history, which is to say that when the Supreme Court made that ruling, they had a blueprint that was already well established it was a blueprint that showed little regard for people who worked in the home. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop there. Great, hey Young. Thank you. Um, I wanna echo the appreciation for this very, very timely and important conversation and is really looking forward to having a, a discussion with Peggy and Gabe and others. So, um, I want to, so let me say, uh, the Nash, I am the senior policy director at the National Domestic Workers Alliance. We represent the interests of 2.2 million domestic workers who work as nannies, house cleaners, and home care workers in private homes. We as an organization, we have 74 affiliate organizations across the country and chapters in 36 cities and 17 states. So I want to talk a little bit about building upon what both Gabe and Peggy said, a little bit of a history and then uh, talk about where we are today in terms of the historic investment in the caregivers um, as a part of Build Back Better agenda. So as I think Peggy and Gabe talked about domestic workers, this is a workforce that's over overwhelmingly women and over half are women of color and about a third are immigrants. <laughs> Domestic workers, along with farm workers, as Peggy talked about and Gabe, were deliberately excluded from the New Deal legislation, right? Including its signature le legislation that extended minimum wage and overtime protection for workers. Unlike farm workers, domestic workers were not expressly excluded in the law when it passed in 1938. On its face, the exclusion appears race and gender neutral. But if you actually dig a little bit more in and research it, committee debates show that the exclusion of domestic workers, along with farm workers, were motivated by racism, allowing employers in the South to dictate the terms and conditions of Black labor and to maintain a racial and social hierarchy. Some legislators opposed the law on the grounds that it threatened to equalize wages between Black and white workers. Others compare the Federal Labor Standards Act, which uh, sets the uh, federal minimum wage floor 
and to anti-lynching legislation. We also see the workings of sexism in the history, right? Seeing domestic work as women's unpaid household labor, as Peggy talked about. Uh, President Roosevelt is quoted saying that the Fair Labor Standard Act is not intended to apply to quote, domestic help, right? But it took a large movement for Congress to finally extend Fair Labor Standards Act coverage to domestic workers, but it only happened in 1974 finding that domestic service actually does affect interstate commerce, right? But it also left out a critical mass of home care workers that Peggy was talking about, right? So only in 2013, millions of home care workers who work in one of the fastest growing occupation in economy are now finally covered under minimum wage and overtime protection. That extension of very basic core workplace project only happened under the Obama years, right? So as you can see, the, the long and ongoing legacy and history and ongoing experience of racial and gender exclusion continues to shape the working lives of domestic workers, right? Um, I can't stress enough, their work is devalued, they're underpaid and largely unprotected in the workplace, right? Peggy talked about some of the home care workers who are unionized, right? They're much more secure. They have um, higher wages, access to benefits, right? But there are millions of other workers who are largely unprotected, right? Who do not have that voice. In 2018, domestic workers earn just about 16,000 a year, right? Significantly lower than other workers whose average annual income was about 39,000, right? The most recent update shows that um, there's 2.4 million home care workers and they're earning about 18,000 a year right now. And wage theft and other workplace violations are pervasive across domestic occupation. And as Gabe talked about, it took a global pandemic to realize that domestic workers, care workers, along with other workers who are overrepresented in service industries like food processing, farm work, retail or essential workers who power our economy in times of crisis and in times of stability. So here we are <laughs> in 2021. President Biden campaigned on investment in caregiving system and building a durable caregiving system as part of his Build Back Better agenda right? And that, that, was, that investment was going to power back our economy from the pandemic-induced recession, right? So this is a once-in-a-generation and historic investment in the care economy. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the home and community-based care, but this investment care economy is across uh, the lifespan. Childcare, universal pre-K, home and community-based care, paid family and medical leave, right? For us at NDWA, we feel like it took us 10 plus years of organizing, of workers, building power, really engaging other strategies like policy change, culture and narrative change to get us to here in 2021 to say that investment in care workers, investment in building a durable caregiving system is going to power back our economy, right? And this is really historic. I know that current media frames the investment in Build Back Better that includes care, climate, and immigration as a social spending, as opposed to the bipartisan infrastructure, which is an investment in physical infrastructure as infrastructure, and the investment in care economy as social spending. But I want to stress that this investment in caregiving system is one of the largest jobs investment an industry that is largely women and women of color, right? Um, it is projected that into 2028, we will need to fill 4.4 million home care jobs, right? Peggy talked about this, the aging of our, sorry, <laughs> let me take a. As Peggy talked about the sort of the aging of our population, every day, 10,000 people turn 65. By 2060, 
over 94 million Americans will be 65 or older, right? And so we need this investment in caregiving to really not just to grow our economy, but really to take care of us as a country, as a nation, and as a community. And I think the inclusion of investment in care economy to stress the historicness, the investment in the home and community-based services is about 8% of that 1.75 trillion that everyone is talking about of the larger Build Back Better agenda, right? So the size of the investment in care as opposed to of the larger investment that is going to address uh, to rebuild our economy is again, I think really uh, shows how significant and how far we come to really shift uh, people's thinking and legislators thinking about the investment in care. But I also don't want to overestimate, right, what it means, because we have a lot more work to do to continue to make sure that this work is uh, treated with dignity, that workers have power in the workplace, right? Uh, but I also want to take a moment to say that, that really this is an important moment, right? The investment in home and community-based services will create 1.6 million new jobs in our care, our economy, right? That includes 500,000 direct care jobs and new jobs for 1.1 million caregivers, right? Who, who's, that the caregiving um, concerns, the family uh, needs for caregiving is really shouldered disproportionately by women, right? So this investment in Build Back Better, this investment in home and community-based services means that 1.1 million caregivers who are largely women could also go back to the labor market um, and really kind of continue to uh, innovate, uh, really tap into their ta uh, ta uh, talents and really grow our economy, right? Um, and I wanna also end by saying that this investment in the caregiving system and care workforce, right? One of the core goal is to create good care jobs, right? And I wanna go back to what Peggy was talking about in terms of the unionization in our country is only about nine states, that this investment is a real opportunity to both raise wages and standards for the workforce, but also create an opportunity for workers to build power, organize and unionize, right? And so I think the investment in the Build Back Better and investment in care infrastructure is about both raising standards, but also building power. So I'll stop there. Great, I thought I might um, throw a couple of questions at you and um, welcome you guys also to jump in with questions of your own for one another. Um, maybe I thought I would start actually, um, Hey Young, where you finished, which is to talk to us about how the labor movement or maybe just your particular component of the labor movement is thinking strategically about how to solve the problem of this as sort of poverty setting wages um, in the care sector. Because I think a, a common way to, to look at this question is, um, you know, wages for everybody um, who isn't in the top, you know, 1% really are stagnating. So if we increase, you know, wages for domestic workers, that's going to be in some kind of conflict with the ability of these families to sustain themselves. And, and I have the sense that there's a really important kind of move that's happening with respect to the way that the healthcare system and state subsidy fit together with the problem also of organizing workers who are isolated as Peggy emphasized. So could you talk a little bit about how, how do you crack that, that strategic problem, both of sort of uh, how to set the set, set decent conditions and wages and allow organizing in a context where in fact, a lot of care is still privatized and, uh, and, and at very low wages in part because of the, the, the broader stagnation economically of the, of the working class and the middle class. Yeah, it's a, it's, I'm really glad that you asked that question. So the way we've been um, thinking about it and the way we are campaigning right now is, um, I wanna sort of drill down into home care workers and home and community-based care, because I think that's very telling of where we could, what we can think about in other parts of the care economy. So the way we've been talking about is, so the, 
this uh, investment in home and community-based services is part of Medicaid program, right? So Medicaid is the largest payer of home care services, right? So that is federal and state government money going in, right? And that given that is the case, right? We wanna make sure that this, the kind of using the lever of federal funding and also state funding as a way to ensure that there is, well, one, importantly, expand services to those who need it, but also plays an important lever to raising wages and uh, working conditions for the workforce, right? And so the way we've been thinking about it is that the investment that the federal government does, right, that needs to be matched by states. One of the kind of, we wanna make sure that funding that goes to the state is not blank, blank checks, that states take this money and do whatever they wanna do, right? We wanna make sure that there are certain strings attached to this federal funding. One of the core policies we're advocating for is if states are gonna take this money to expand services, build out the home care system at their state level, that one of the core pieces they have to do is what we're calling a rate setting uh, process. So it's essentially like a, almost like a wage board kind of process, but it's really also, it's about really requiring the states to bring all the stakeholders together, right? Workers, employers, uh, people who receive care, right? To the table and really democratize a process and have them come together, look at what the um, adequate wage rate ought to be, which I think often Medicaid sees as reimbursement of services, right? And so as Peggy was saying, in this kind of Medicaid system, right? There are 2.4 million workers who go to every day to provide these services, but they often focus on the services rather than the needs of the workers, right? So we're calling it a race setting process, but it's really a process to look at whether workers are getting paid adequate wages, right? And then really evaluate and determine what ought to be adequate wage, right? So that's one vehicle through which we're really thinking about using policy levers, right? to ensure that the states and federal governments do the right thing, right? There's other ways that I think we're really excited about this expansion of funding, as a, which is going to create this huge need for more workers to move from the private pay market into the public funded, right? Again, I think giving us another opportunity to organize, aggregate workers and unionize, right? So I think there is a, organizing component to this work that's very much focused on uh, what seems like right now a policy and kind of like inside the Beltway Congress decision. But when this law is passed into law, I think our goal is to really be in motion across the country with other partners, right? Um, to really think about making sure that this funding is able to set up a good system and process to raise wages and ability for workers to have voice and organize. Could I Amazing. ask that? Yes, please, please. Oh, so I, I agree with everything He Yen said, and I wanted to tie it back to a bit of what I think you were trying to get at, which is, you know, what about those folks who don't have access to publicly financed home care, right? Because what we're talking about in that context is really, right, Medicare providing, Medicaid, I should say, providing the bulk of the funding sources. And for a long time, the wages paid to those workers were always artificially low. Why? Because you had one employer, right? I mean, you had different employers in terms of different states, but it was always the government. And there were these documents that I found at some point sort of advising states how to ensure they could really limit the amount of money that they were going to pay uh, to workers providing publicly subsidized care. When it comes to people who have to pay out of pocket, I mean, that raises an interesting point, right? Because in an ideal world, uh, I expect, and I think we all expect, that as a result of Biden's proposal, we're going to get the compensation rates up for people who provide publicly subsidized care. 
And given that that is going to be the primary sort of uh, market wage that is going to adversely impact the costs that people who are paying out of pocket have to pay for their care. But I don't think you do that by saying, okay, we've got to worry about those folks. So we should continue to hold down the wages paid to publicly subsidized care. I think that calls for a different type of intervention. Uh, and rather that's by way of greater tax breaks to families, for example, who actually need to pay out of pocket for their long-term care when it comes to trying to provide for family members who are elderly. I'll ask um, maybe one more question and then may want to turn it over to any of you who want to um, pose a question, which is um, one of the questions that um, is in the framing of the panel, actually, which is sort of how you think about the care as infrastructure debate that the Biden bill kind of kicked off. Um, what does it tell us about the politics of care today? Does it matter whether we think of care as infrastructure? Um, is it more important to think of care as work than as infrastructure? Um, or just sort of reactions you had to that, that kind of moment um, of uh, public debate about all of care in, in the economy and to, our, um, to the way that we think about sort of building out structures that support, um, support us. Can I jump in on that? Yeah. I think it's a really good and provocative question. And I think that because I find myself reacting in opposite ways to it. Um, on the one hand, I think it makes good political sense to argue for care as infrastructure because it's no less necessary mm -hmm. than, than, you know, repairing bridges and, and, you know, broadband and lead pipes and all the other things that we talk about, sort of classical physical infrastructure. It's, no, it's equally essential, but it's often devalued for many of the reasons that we've been talking about for the whole past hour. Uh, who does it, under what circumstances they're expected to do it, and so on. Um, but I want to kind of try to nuance that a little bit uh, by saying that I think, you know, there's, if you, uh, Harris v. Quinn came up earlier, and obviously it's a terrible decision, but I think it's an interesting decision because, you know, a lot of it was getting litigated on First Amendment questions. That's the 2014 decision where um, uh, public, public uh, where home care workers kind of prefigured the Janus public sector broader decision uh, in terms of union rights. Um, and it got litigated on First Amendment questions, but in order to win the First Amendment case, the labor movement had to kind of argue that there's nothing intrinsically political about, about the working conditions of home care workers. And I do think actually the question of who is entitled to care, under what circumstances they give it, who has to provide it and under what circumstances they provide it is a fundamentally political question, right? It's a question about how we relate to each other, about what we think it should be like to be old or to be disabled or to be a woman or to be a worker. It's a fundamentally political question and many other categories besides those, obviously. And I think uh, the reason that, you know, arguing for care as infrastructure is politically potent and worth doing right now is exactly because it again lets us kind of blur the question of the fundamental political issues in terms of how we relate to one another. Um, and so that's not an argument against doing it. I, I think it's right to do it. And I think it's very exciting that, you know, the labor movement and, and the NDWA and SAU and many other organizations have advanced the ball as far as they have in terms of, you know, this argument for care as infrastructure in term and made it actually possible to win the games that it looks like we may be about to win. And that will be transformative for millions and millions of people. Uh, I think I just wanted to kind of say that as a way of saying that I, th I, I not worry, but I think it's worth talking about in the longer term. Uh, is there a kind of depoliticizing move that we make when we say care is infrastructure? Is it a way of trying to make the political questions uh, less central that we do have to actually struggle over? Thanks. Um, I will add to that. Um, I think care work is central to infrastructure. It's what makes all other work possible uh, in so many ways. And once upon a time, I had a very naive perspective and I thought, wouldn't it be grand if we had a world that did right by folks who did domestic care work in the home, 
because it was the right thing to do, because it was no longer acceptable to treat this class of workers as somehow uniquely and always different and inferior than all other forms of paid work, right? Like we ought to just do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And because in fact, what they're doing is important work. But the reality is, is that has never gotten us very far, right? Uh, and I think this is why, as Hey Yoon points out, this is such a pivotal, pivotal phase that we're in because people do see what workers in the home do as infrastructure and what's leading that conversation. Really, let's face it, it's not so much about the workers, right? It's about the fact that we've come to this realization that absent the workers, um, we're going to be left in a predicament where other folks are not able to continue contributing to the economy. But in my ideal world, I wish that were not true. I wish that we were motivated more so by the fact that this work is valuable like other types of work, but I'll take what I can get. Um, I would add, you know, when that whole debate started, um, some days initial reaction was like, well, we have to like frame up care as infrastructure, just like physical infrastructure. And some days I feel like we made some progress on sort of winning that argument. Other days I feel like we haven't. But I think one thing that's similar to what Peggy was saying, like in as part of this campaign, one of the senators said, he said the investment in home and community-based services is a right investment at the right time in right people to prevent us as a country, uh, prevent us from a crisis becoming a catastrophe, right? And so to me, like, I value what that one senator said in terms of this importance of the role of care in our economy uh, versus whether we frame it up as an infrastructure or not. But I also do think words have impact, right? And because I think there is a whole host of reasons why this workforce, these workers, why care is so devalued, right? And I think to let, put it on the same sort of footing as like, roads and bridges as infrastructure, I think will be helpful, right? I just think that we have a lot more work to do to get there as a country. Great. Um, so I'm looking at the, the really excellent list of questions that we have and thinking that this may be a good moment to shift to those questions since we're gonna try to wrap this up by 1.30. Um, and probably what I'll do is throw this at one of you, because if all three of you answer each question, we won't be able to get through very many of them, but feel free to deflect it to one of your compatriots um, if, you, if you want. Um, and I'll try to sort of batch them a little bit. Um, so the, 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 what, well, let me start with the one that John Rudnick asked, which is about how information technology um, you know, is, is wrapped up in the racialized, gendered, class nature of care work in the US. And I guess I'm curious, to, to hear, and maybe I'll, I'll start with Hey Young. One, how you know information technology, cameras in the home, things like that are affecting care work, but also is it is it affecting your organizing? And sort of how do you think about the politics of technology as it's entering into this question um, in the present day? Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, care work is actually also another interesting where. You know, I know we've been in the last few years been talking a lot about the rise of gig work and the, the forever increasing precariousness in work. And one of the sectors that the there was a rise of platform was actually in care work, right? Uh, with Handy and there were a few other kind of companies that set up to, and there's care.com that is like uh, multinational. I think they reached like 9 billion families across the globe, right? And so I think that uh, technology is definitely, you know, is intervening with care work. And I think how we've been thinking about it is making sure that we figure out a set of strategies that leverage 
all that technology can offer us to advance uh, and continue to transform care jobs into good jobs and making sure workers have voice, as well as to make sure that we're very clear eyed about the negative impact of technology. So I think we're straddling those two worlds, right? And I would say one of the things that, and we are really thinking about both um, various different strategies. There is like policy, public policy making, right? But also we're actively engaging private sector to develop strategies to raise wages and standards, right? And that is like, I think it was a few months ago, we actually went out public with a, an agree, a private agreement we reached with Handy Company, which is the, one of the platforms that uh, uh, helps uh, people get house cleaning jobs, right? That we've entered into an agreement that allowing Handy to one, raise the wages of Handy workers and also put money into a system uh, that we have a role in administering that provides benefits to workers. So I think that's an example of where we're trying to sort of leverage um, the, the technology, the power of technology to advance our uh, agenda, as well as making sure that it is not in any way continued to um, deteriorate the working conditions of the workers who go to technology to find jobs. Great. Um, so I think I will batch together two sets of questions that are also in the in the Q and A about one immigration, so how to think about the connection between immigration and the care economy, and and particularly things for building power um, among those who are, um, you know, I guess some one of the questions puts it in a legal gray zone, and certainly in a different distinct status if they're undocumented than than others that they might be working alongside. How do you how do you protect those workers? But there's at the same time a set of questions emerging about the international um, labor organizing context, and sort of how, and and they might be one might relate them, or you could treat them separately. So I just wanted to let me start first with um, Peggy and Gabe. If you wanted to take on um, one piece of that, um, either of you. So I think one of the things that is really clear when you think about some of the limitations of labor organizing and unionization is that now is the time, it's always really been the time with regard to this work, but to double down on non-union approaches uh, for purposes of advocating on behalf of workers. Uh, and so there's some interesting, right, sort of work being done by way of different advocacy groups, by way of worker-run cooperatives, where I think they have done a somewhat better job of addressing the concerns that immigrant workers may have about getting involved in a more formal structure. Uh, so I think we have to be really attentive to looking at, you know, what are those avenues? Uh, particularly, you know, we've got nine states that have passed legislation that give workers the right to organize and unionize. Uh, the rest of those states don't have that at all. So I think as a general matter, we need to be sort of focused on strategies that will address worker concerns uh, above and beyond what you're going to see in the context of formal uh, labor unions. I guess I'll just, uh, I, I agree with all of that and I'll just try to add on to it in a couple of ways. Uh, I mean, one, I think, you know, in a global context, we can see the rise of low wage and precarious care work in this country as of a piece with the kind of global informalization of work that's happened in a very dramatic way over the last half century, um, in particular has happened to poor women around the world. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, that makes it kind of a quite daunting problem, right, because it's sort of seems to have massive structural forces powering it if it's happening everywhere and makes it uh, makes reform uh, a very high bar. Um, 
On the other hand, I think it creates real possibilities for solidarity, both domestically and internationally, uh, particularly as the kind of care economy working class in this country um, becomes composed very heavily of immigrants and children of immigrants. Um, I think, you know, the um, in particular, the opportunity that it creates into our domestic politics is for a quite different conversation potentially around immigration politics that could come out of the real social relationships between caregivers and care providers. Um, I think in general, and a lot of this conversation has been touching on this, improving working conditions in informal and precarious care work has depended on the construction of political coalitions, possibly attached to or around unions, but as Peggy is saying, also in taking other forms, uh, political coalitions which extend beyond workers themselves. Um, and I think, you know, one of the most exciting things about the, the care workers movement has been how it really embodies a significant possibility for doing that because of the intimate social relationships between care workers and the people who they take care of and the ways that we do depend on care workers and can potentially come to appreciate their essential quality through that dependence. Um, and so I think in that kind of intimate relationship is the basis for a broader kind of solidarity. And that has really been the kind of, you know, I think core of the coalitions that have been built in a lot of, well, at the state level and city level in a lot of places. Um, and I think, you know, imagining building, uh, imagining kind of po a politics of care work that builds on that principle, that a, a kind of broad social solidarity is what's needed to change the conditions in which we both give and receive care. Uh, also lets us think about new kinds of both international solidarity and a different kind of immigration politics to, domestically, potentially, as the reality is that, as we've been saying this whole conversation, the country is aging really rapidly. Uh, this workforce is going to continue to grow, and that means it's going to become increasingly internationalized even more than it is now. Um, can I just add here, I'm glad I really appreciate this question, and I was going to include it in my early initial remark, is that I think the way we think about the immigration is, so I would say two things. One is that um, we have to shift how we think about immigration policies in this country, not just as regulating who can come into this country, but as a labor market policy, right? This country has always used immigration policy as a labor market policy, right? And historically it's brought the brought workers from abroad to be exploited, right? The agents came as coolies and obviously it's not even beginning to in terms of the, the enslaved people, right? So I wanna, so I think we have to really figure out how do we talk about immigration reform as also labor market policy. And then I would say that what we're trying to do as a part of a broader movement is really push for um, increased protection for immigrant workforce in this country as part of the Build Back Better. And part of that reasoning is that we strong, that there is no question that the path to citizenship or path to some level of lasting protection has to be a necessary ingredient to transform jobs into good jobs. There's just no way about it, right? Um, and so I think, so I would just say that it's important and we are trying, um, yeah. Um, I want to jump to a question about Build Back Better. So what specifically is in there that means a lot in, and of course it hasn't passed yet, um, but that would affect, the, is it, so is it just about money for care services or is it actually changing the infrastructure? And I think this kind of relates actually back to the question we were just talking about, which is sort of, are we talking about old style unionization? How do you do that in this context? Are we really, is it about unions versus non-unions? You mentioned wage boards, which I think speaks to something that unions are, are more and more interested in, which is a somewhat different structure for thinking about how you shape the labor market than, than maybe um, uh, the unions, unions have relied on before. So would, would you mind, maybe I just will start with um, Hyung again, d d like what specifically is in Build Back Better that's structural beyond the uh, just money, um, very important, but, but funding um, for services? And how does that relate to this question we're having about the where, where do unions fit in and is there something broader, whether it's bargaining for the common good or wage boards, or maybe you could decode some of that for us? Yeah, I mean, I think the big buckets of the funding is uh, climate, uh, immigration and care, right? And in the care economy, there's it is like it is funding, but 
the funding isn't just to expand you know services whether it's child care or child tax credit right but it is really specifically money to set up systems for the these systems to be durable right so in home and community based services component of care economy what we've been advocating for is that there needs to be uh, adequate funding to expand services raise wages for the workforce and improve the job conditions and build a durable system right and so the there has to be sufficient funding for states to take up that money to begin that infrastructure building at the state level and part of the work that we're doing is really thinking about that you know how do you build a system that is going to leverage uh, workers having a voice and organizing, right? So we're very much thinking about that. Um, you know, and I think that, um, you know, the similar goes to childcare, right? But there's also these very critical pieces of programs like pay leave that allows for, you know, people, working families, especially women, to go back to the labor market and have a real shot at economic security, right? That's also about system building, right? So I would think about um, there are like the structural changes will come about as a result of these programs being implemented and being implemented in a robust way. Um, to flowing out of that, you know, the status quo seems to be that paid family leave was eliminated, right? For, um, and that's that's interesting. And, and it, you know, in part, there's a set of questions on the in the Q&A about how do we relate the paid care work to unpaid care work? And sort of what are the politics of, you know, the emphasis on paid versus unpaid care work? And does the fact that paid family leave did get dropped reflect sort of broader um, a broader politics about uncommodified care versus commodified care or paid work versus unpaid work. Um, curious, um, maybe go back to, to uh, Gabe or Peggy on, on this one first. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't feel close enough to the kind of parliamentary maneuvering to say exactly what, you know, what has led to what development in the negotiations. But I do think, um, you know, I think the child tax credit is an exciting and transformative policy, but I have certainly felt a kind of moment of nervousness as someone who knows the history of the Social Security Act and the ways that the Social Security Act, um, as I was saying in my seven minutes before, um, pushed, pushed women in particular into unpaid housework as opposed to the forms of low wage employment that were available to them. I felt nervous about seeing the child tax credit seem to advance politically faster or, or more than uh, than paid leave seems able to do. Uh, and, you know, we can speculate probably justifiably about that, as I think you're doing, Amy, about what the causes of that have been in terms of uh, the kind of limits in labor market transformation and the gendered politics of labor market transformation. Um, but I think, you know, we, uh, we, we there's kind of waiting and seeing we have to do about who is causing what to happen. I guess I will just say though, that um, it's very striking in particular thinking about West Virginia and the role that West Virginia is playing in, in congressional maneuvering, uh, you know, a state where 2% of the workforce, I think is maybe five, but a very small percent of the workforce is in um, coal mining and where a disproportionately large share of the workforce is in healthcare and social assistance. I think up, uh, 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 between 15, 16, maybe up to 20%, I can't remember off the top of my head, but larger than the national level, as is generally true of formerly industrial places. Um, that's a very feminized workforce as it is across the country. Um, and it aggravates the um, ability of women to enter and stay, obviously aggravates the ability of women to enter and stay in and um, you know, navigate that labor market that actually does exist to alter the policy in the way that it looks like it's been altered. Um, and I do th think that there is a very serious mismatch between sections of the Democratic Party and the reality of the kind of workers and labor markets that they're seeking to reform and represent. So uh, I, I, I must say that I'm not up to date on the background with respect to the trade-offs 
uh, between the choices. But, you know, I think about paid family leave. And if you're a parent, I think you really think paid family leave is about childcare, right? Uh, I think most parents, they may have other obligations with respect to caring, but I think a lot of it comes down to this emphasis on, you know, having the ability to take time off with pay with regard to childcare. Uh, and so I'm just talking out loud here about perhaps from that perspective, a perceived uh, greater equity from the standpoint that, you know, if it's about sort of putting more funds into home and community-based care, that on some level, that is going to affect everyone, uh, but that's just a random thought out loud. Because we've been trying for a long time to get paid family care uh, and we've not gotten paid family care. So I wasn't terribly optimistic that it was actually going to ultimately uh, show up in the final proposal. Time maybe for just one more, and um, I'm not sure who wants to comment on it, but Sophia Tanu uh, posed this question about the caregiving and public investment versus private equity and health insurance. And I think it's something we haven't really touched on yet. So how do you think about, you know, the very big role that private equity has and that private health insurers have in the shape of the care, you know, kind of environment? And, and how do we think about that private power and its um, relationship to public investment and what the politics we, we ought to have toward that private power ought to be? So who wants to jump in on that one? Can I say something very quickly about that? Um, I think that we ought to see the entire care economy as having a kind of fissured structure, uh, as which is a structure that we're accustomed to seeing in the private sector, thinking about you know, the relationship of a McDonald's worker to the franchise, to the you know, larger franchising corporation, or there are many examples of this, but in other words, a structure in which there is an intermediating layer, which is essentially able to play off uh, workers against the, the, you know, the sources of control and investment, typically. Uh, healthcare, or all care, is a kind of essentially social and political function. And it's, it, our care systems have been generated through political processes, um, but a, an enormous layer of private actors have, has managed to interpose itself into the core of the system, both absorbing revenue and then dispersing as little care as possible and holding down wages as much as possible. And I think once we, if we try to reframe it as every hospital, every nursing home, every home care agency, is a subcontractor for the public interest and largely behaving the way subcontractors behave, which is trying to lower labor costs. Um, I think it can, that can be helpful in uh, thinking about the kind of politics of this. I would just add that this is an area that we need to be monitoring and really understand better because um, private equity has entered into the home care sector, right? And that because, I mean, it makes sense, it's one of the fastest growing occupation and economy, right? And they see that there is profits to be made, right? So this is definitely a very, very important issue that we are paying attention to. I was gonna say, I would add a final comment. Uh, so I was chatting with some folks in Washington state and apparently they're spending a lot of time these days uh, looking at how they can, in fact, sort of turn back some of the publicly subsidized home care back into the hands of private companies, you know, and not just by way of agency care. So it will be interesting to see what comes out of Washington, given that Washington, without a doubt, is probably the leader in terms of how it currently uh, treats home care providers, both those doing the publicly subsidized care as well as the non-publicly subsidized care. So I thought it was a fascinating move. 
That's actually a wonderful place to end. And I think we haven't talked much about how this conversation relates to aspirations for Medicare for all um, and the kind of fundamental kind of political economy of our health care uh, insurance industry. Um, that's going to be something we'll take up in some of the panels in the spring. So um, look forward to some of those conversations continuing. And please, you know, thanks very much to Corinne, Brianna, Rule, all that made this event happen in a structural way and all their uh, reproductive work behind the scenes. And thanks to all of you guys for, for joining me for this really terrific conversation. I, I really appreciate the time and it, it could, couldn't be more important. So um, thanks for the, for the work that you're doing and we'll see you all soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone.